the things that, you know, he's a not a great dresser, he's an inch shorter than I wanted, he doesn't listen to really cool music, he's not as fond of camping as I am. These are things that really most of us could work around. It's hard enough to find someone who understands you, listens to you, sees the best in, of you, and wants to be with you, that I don't want the tyranny of small differences to ultimately affect your relationships unless it has to. Hey, this is Evan Mark Katz, dating coach for smart, strong, successful women, and your personal trainer for love. Welcome back to the Love You podcast. Keep listening to discover whether you make too big a deal about small differences. When we're done, I'll let you know how you could apply to Love You to create a passionate relationship where you feel safe, heard, and understood. Now, I know you've been dying to know what happened with my Love You boot camp, but it was maybe the biggest success I've ever had in 20 years. It was really, really exciting. We had 40 people uh, in Love You boot camp for, uh, I don't know, it was a five, six hour uh, boot camp where I taught everything about Love You that I could in that allotted time. And we brought in um, clients who've had success in the course to give testimony about uh, how they experienced Love You. And this one just moved in with their boyfriend and this one is married and it was really an, just an amazing experience, and out of the 40 people, uh, 13 of them signed up for Love You Live, uh, my signature coaching program at the end. So it was just a, a wonderful day for women to get their power back and learn to believe in love and make better dating and relationship choices that result in a healthy, happy, long-term relationship. And uh, based on the success of it, I'm, I'm confident we will do it again. I don't know exactly when, um, hopefully once by the end of the year. So for those who were definitely worried about that, I wanted to get that out of the way. Now, I got some interesting stuff. Um, I put thought into these scripts, and that's part of the problem is I'm a writer uh, first, and so I tend to write the equivalent of longhand. I write in long Google Docs, and I can't memorize everything I'm saying, and I'm a one-man studio, so sometimes I have to look down at my notes. Forgive me for that. I also learned from a friend today that I've been holding the microphone wrong and that the microphone, this microphone in particular, is better vertical, which is why you're seeing a vertical mic instead of a tilted mic, which means you probably have better sound, but I'm quite sure this is obscuring my face on the YouTube video. My apologies for that as well. Maybe it's a good thing that we're obscuring the bottom of my face. I'm not positive. So let us begin. Wikipedia definition. The narcissism of small differences is the idea that the more a relationship shares commonalities, the more likely the people in it are to engage in interpersonal feuds and mutual ridicule because of hypersensitivity to minor differences perceived in each other. Where have I heard this before? Right. So this is the narcissism of small differences, the tyranny of small differences, and it's pervasive in our society, especially in the internet age, especially in the social media age, where everybody puts out all of their thoughts and feelings all the time. And then we find things to grab onto that we don't like. So we see this in politics. Hillary versus Bernie people back in 2016 at each other's throats, even though Congress, you know, the congressional quarterly would say they vote together 95% of the time. Uh, there's the, 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 Trump people versus the the rhinos, the people who believe in the same policies, but they're at each other's throats over differences of opinion. Uh, I know there's more to it. I don't want to open up that can of forums. I know there are actually differences between Bernie and Hillary people. But the point is we spend so much time focused on the differences and we get so angry about the differences that we sort of forget we're turning our allies essentially into enemies. This is what happens in dating. So we also saw this during covid I got a, a good friend who's uh, anti-vaxxer. Uh, it definitely caused a chill in her relationships with a lot of people, at least in, in our our community. Um, and she was very passionate about her her research and her reading. And I'm not going to you know get into the details of it, but this is something she felt very very passionate about. Um, but because she's such an amazing friend, like just an all star friend. It never occurred to me that this difference would come between us, even if we vociferously disagreed and can point to different science to make our cases. Um, knowing who she is as a person, that overrides everything. The problem is, when it comes to dating, 
you don't always know these things about a person. They're a stranger. So we take little bits of information and we, we draw larger character judgments based on very limited information. Um, imagine, not even imagine. We're being very literal now. What if me and my anti-vax friend met on a dating app? We don't become really, really close friends because of this perceived huge difference in our worldviews, which in practice, in terms of our friendship, really doesn't matter very, very much. So this is the narcissism of small differences. The more information we have, the more information we can use against each other. And in a world where it's understood that everybody's going to Google stalk everybody and go on all their social media and do a deep dive on their crushes, anything you say can and will be used against you. Um, and more, more pointedly, anything you find about him, you can and use, can and will use against him. So that's what happens when there's a million dating and relationship choices. There's infinite numbers of men out there. And we only have limited information. We don't know how this person is as a person. All we know is the thing he put on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, right? Or what we checked out in his link, LinkedIn bio. And you could go deeper if you're that serious. Just remember, we dated before all this. There was a world before dating apps. There was a world before online dating sites. There was a world where the way you got to know someone was getting to know them, just having conversations with them. You go on dates. Maybe you talked on the phone to allow someone to reveal who they are. Um, but now we have so much choice, at least the perception of choice. We think we have infinite options that we can find anything wrong with someone and use this as the reason that the relationship is DOA, and which is not to say that there aren't some valid reasons that relationships are DOA. Uh, there are genuinely major chasms between people. And it's not my job to tell you what those things are. Maybe the things I just talked about, politics or vaccines, are your major chasms. That's fine. The problem is you got more than that too. So let me acknowledge, I understand why, right? And when I'm, when I'm issuing this message to you, I'm not judging you for doing these things. I'm only pointing out what I see all the time in my own clients. This is, this is the most normal thing in the world. I just don't think in love you terminology, it's a very effective way to date, but it is very normal because no one wants to get hurt. No one wants to waste time. We're looking for red flags. So any clue that you have at the beginning that you might be misaligned in the long run gets really amplified. The problem, as you know, if you're a regular listener to the love you podcast is that these clues are at best misleading or potentially misleading. And sometimes they're outright irrelevant. So I use myself as an example. Now, again, this is not, I'm, it's always easiest to use myself as an example, um, not to hijack the conversation about you and the men that, that you're dating. But when I was on match.com 17 years ago, at the same time as my wife, I, I listed myself as Jewish. I happen to be a Jewish atheist, which is a whole, whole thing unto itself, which I'm not going to get into here, but I listed myself as Jewish. Now, my wife was 16 years of Catholic school, like a lot of Catholic school. And so realistically, she might have looked at me and said, oh, Jewish guy, that means I, he's going to want me to convert to Judaism in order to be with him. Because that's a somewhat common thing that Jewish guys do if they want to raise Jewish children, they ask their wives to convert. And that's a Again, a common trope because there's some reality to it. But I'm not that guy. I never asked her to convert to my religion. She can believe whatever she wants. All right. So if she went in looking at a data point in my dating profile and determined that I was going to be like her stereotype of what Jewish guys do, I wouldn't be in this relationship. She wouldn't be in this marriage 15 years later. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary this year. And that's just in one very tiny example of how someone could pick up some, some, on something in someone's profile and assume it means X, Y, and Z without full information. I remember I had a client once upon a time who was in her late 60s. She passed on a guy because he listed one of his hobbies as aviation and she didn't enjoy flying. As if like on a day-to-day -day basis, he was going to force her to get on planes against her will. <laughs> Right. These are the kind of things that we see very, very frequently. Um, 
Uh, I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with Lori Gottlieb. Um, she's an old friend of mine. She writes the uh, Ask a Therapist column for The Atlantic. She has a best-selling book called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. Her previous book is one that I was somewhat influential in helping her compose uh, called um, Marry Him, The Case for Settling for Mr. Good Enough. And uh, she's, she's, to me, is like a perfect example in the way she describes herself in the book. I'm not throwing her under the bus. We were coaching together and she would go online and she'd see, oh my God, I live in Beverly Hills. He lives in Sherman Oaks, which is the more suburban part of LA. That must mean he's like a boring dentist because literally everybody lives who lives in the suburbs is a boring dentist. Oh, this guy likes Grateful Dead music. That must be mean he is a stoner who never grew up from high school and is kind of a slacker who has no motivation. It's or maybe he just likes the Grateful Dead. Right? Like you see how when we extrapolate these things to assume the stereotype, it doesn't always apply. Could apply, but it doesn't always apply. And we're making these decisions based on a profile. So there are valid reasons to pass on men. I just haven't talked about any of them so far on this podcast. Right? It's whether he wants to be married, whether he makes you a priority, whether he's a good listener, whether he's a man of high character, whether his words and his deeds match each other, whether he's trustworthy. And the thing is, you usually can't figure this out from a dating app profile. Nor could you figure this out from a handful of texts, nor could you figure this out from a first date. And this is the problem. We make most of our decisions. We're looking for our spouse from a profile with it that has 15 words on it, right? When in fact, we're getting a list of hobbies that let us know whether we're aligned, but they say nothing about who that person is, just whether we share things in common. So this A is a problem if, you choose men based on the obvious height, weight, age, education, income, blah, 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 blah. And if you screen guys out for reasons that might have another interpretation, my way of practicing Judaism, right? Someone else's aviation hobby. Now imagine if the same lens is leveled at you where men are dissecting you on the same information. You're two years older than his max age, right? He's looking for women uh, uh, 40 to 49. He's 54. He's looking for women 40 to 49. You're 51. So by that token, th those two years mean that obviously you're not a compatible fit for him. Now, that's obviously nonsense, but he's got the right to do that. He's going to assume that if you're around his age, he can find someone who's more attractive than you, da 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 in his fantasy is someone who is more appealing to him, but he hasn't experienced the reality of you. He doesn't know you. He's just screening you out based on your age. You're five pounds heavier than his ideal body type. Maybe if he met you in person at a party, he'd be wildly attracted to you. We don't know that because he's screening out based on limited information. Maybe you don't list any hobbies that overlap with him and he's really passionate about his interests. Well, Let's say a guy's really passionate about baseball. Does that mean you have to be really passionate about baseball? No. If he thinks you do, then that's a problem. But just imagine if all the tiny things that are online about you, he chose to pass you up for this tyranny, the narcissism of small differences. And so maybe you live 10 miles outside of his max search radius. He's not willing to go that far. Maybe you say something on your date about going to therapy or doing self-help or personal growth, or maybe you mention how awful your ex was and he clearly decides that you're a lot of drama and that you, you uh, choose toxic relationships and he doesn't want to be a part of those toxic relationships just because you opened your heart up and shared with him. Right. These are the things that people do. We pick up on a little detail and we assume that we know the whole story and it's not fair, it's not right, and it needs to change. So we can't always help how we react to the narcissism of small differences. What we can do is not let them get in the way. There's our initial reaction, this person's different, I see something I don't like here. Keep on gathering information, try to experience people instead of trying to read the tail of the tape to avoid wasting time. These differences are often a very small part 
of the larger story that you end up building with someone in your marriage, says the happily married guy. So uh, I hope that made sense to you. Uh, I know I, I know it's a lot, uh, but I think it's worth your time because if you can get past some of these things, you're really going to double your dating pool. That's how powerful this is. You can double your dating pool by just taking the advice that I just gave you. If any of that is appealing to you, and it's not just about doubling your dating pool, but you actually want to find a man who loves you unconditionally and you really want to stop attracting the wrong kind of guys online and learn how to sift through the wreckage of the awful people online and find the good ones, the diamonds in the rough. That's what we do in Love You. Go to evanmarkatz.com forward slash apply. Watch my video. Uh, learn how to fix your broken man picker. Fill out an application and I will talk to you on the phone and figure out uh, how I can serve you. Next, our small wins every week in Love You Live. We've got a whole bunch of women, maybe 30 women on on the screen and we ask everybody to share their their small wins um i don't know if i shared this last week but we had a we had a really really great week um with two people getting engaged and two other people uh talking about their new boyfriends uh we had someone post this week that she's she's pregnant um in her mid 40s so really really lots of good things we get to see this week's love you small win is something nice and simple that's the nature of the small win it's a step forward towards your ultimate goal I had a wonderful third date at an art museum, and I had great conversations with my date. It felt like progress since my last great third date was over 10 years ago. Right. So I always gesticulate a lot, but when I talk about talk to people in our breakout call, our breakthrough call on those, uh, those applications, I always talk about this is your destination, this is where you're headed, you're going in this direction, and each thing along the way is a small win. So imagine someone who hasn't had a good third date for 10 years, all right? Joining this course and six weeks later, finding someone that she has excitement with, hope with, promise with. This is not to say that that man is her husband. It means she's headed in the right direction. Now, my recommended read for the week is when do you tell someone that you are different? Uh, and I, I, I've been trying to make these Love You podcasts somewhat thematic where the recommended read goes with the, the whatever the hell I call it, the, the, I call it the Love You Insight. I was going to say lecture. The Love You Insight I give at the beginning sort of parallels what we do at the end. So this is on evanmarkatz.com. You can find the link in the uh, show notes or in YouTube or Apple. And let's just say that the world is made up of very, very unique individuals. Um, I think that's fair to say that there, it, it takes all kinds. I know that uh, last month I took my family to the Renaissance Fair. And when you go to the Renaissance Fair, it's, it's kind of like Halloween, right? Everybody's in costume. I'm not in costume. I'm not sure if it's because I think I'm too cool for it. I'm not sure if I don't want to have to buy a costume to attend an outdoor festival where I'm going to end up spending $200. I'm not really sure what my motivation is, but this is like my fifth or sixth time going to the Renaissance Fair, uh, both with my wife and uh, to a lesser degree with my kids. We went with the kids this year. And it's always extraordinary, but it's really a weird culture. But the people who are immersing themselves in it know it, right? It's cosplay it's going to comic-con and so that is not a huge part of my identity my only point is if you're a ren fair person and someone doesn't understand the culture of the renaissance fair and they know that you 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 call yourself maid marion for a few weeks a year and dressed up in dressed up in a in a corset and speak in old english that might be really surprising to someone who's never met anybody like that before you might not want to share that information at the very beginning of the relationship now again it's a that's a sort of benign hobby that people might be weirded out by and i'm copying to it at the top of, of the call because i think it's important to understand right i'm a pretty mainstream person my wife is so not edgy we call her round so there's nothing about me that's partic particularly edgy uh at the same time I have flaws that I wouldn't want to reveal to people right, you know, at the very, very beginning. Um, 
you know, I, I have been anxiety problems. I had anxiety problems starting in college and they were surfaced in my twenties when I was unemployed and they come around every, every once and again, when things get stressful at work and I become an insomniac and I sometimes have to take, uh, anti-anxiety pills and all that kind of stuff. It's a big part of who I am, but it doesn't define me. So when do I bring this information up? And we can run down the list of when do you let someone know you're different. Maybe it's taking antidepressants. Maybe you've had three marriages. Maybe you have herpes. And, and I've got clients who share these things in, in the comments section. Right? <laughs> these, are, these are my clients. Victorian ballroom dancing. Diaper wearing. <laughs> previous arrests. Scoliosis. Fathers who abandoned. Right? These are all right, things that might be viewed through a negative lens that someone could theoretically hold uh, against you. So I know I'm very lucky, right? I've led a, a, a privileged life with parents who stayed together for 30 years and gave me unconditional love and resources to go to a decent college, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yet I still have things that, that someone could judge me against that I wouldn't want people to know, that I wouldn't advertise. Um, my wife too. Again, I just think this is so universal. That's why we're talking about it in depth, right? Even for the most normal of people, my, my wife... Uh, was 40 grand in debt when we started dating. Didn't tell me about it for nine months because she knew that I had never paid a dollar of credit card debt and I might be judgmental about that. And she was right. But by the time nine months rolled around, I was already in. <laughs> so, right. So there's when you receive the information it makes a really big difference in terms of how you receive the information and what you do with the information. So all the things we're talking about today, which, you know, sort of in rapid fire, are these deal breakers or are they quirks? And that's also something that's sort of subjective. If you're in love and it's something you think you can live with, then it might just be a quirk. It doesn't have to define the relationship. But some of these things that I just mentioned could be large differences. Right? There's a difference between someone who needs a pill to help them sleep and someone who's so clinically depressed that they can't get out of bed in the morning, hold down a job, and frequently think of killing themselves. That's there's a whole spectrum there. But again, we don't know. We can't always experience that. All you have is someone's reporting, self-reporting to tell you, right? And then there's what you experience. So there's always going to be red flags in a relationship. The question is, is this going to impact the relationship or not? All right? There are people who are active social drinkers, and there are people who are barely functioning alcoholics. I do not want to lump them in together. All right? So understand you can focus on your differences and make them into the thing. If anything, we're always trying to figure out, is this something I can live with if nothing changed for the rest of my life and I would still be happy? Right? But let's not make a mistake. I'm not telling you to tolerate everything. Right? If, if there's, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to use myself, for example, because this actually happened to me. Someone who likes being choked in bed I had, at one point in time, this is, and this is before it became like a huge popular thing on the internet. I met, I was dating two people at once who wanted me to choke them in bed. That is not something that I do, <laughs> right? And if it's not something that you do, you're not something comfortable with that. And a guy feels that he needs to have rough sex to be happy. You're not obliged to indulge, right? But I could think of my wife's aunt who is a ballroom dancer, and that's a big thing for her, and she's been taking lessons, and her husband has absolutely is an old military guy. He's got no interest in dancing. He's, at this point in his life, he's lost the capacity. So she has a regular dance partner who she sees once or twice a week, right, well into her 70s, and it's not a threat to the relationship, and she doesn't need him to dance, and she has a little separate life outside of him, and everybody's happy because they're getting their needs met. There are other women who are like, you need to learn ballroom dancing with me because I'm competitive and you need to be there with me. And it's not necessarily true. So we want things that don't pull focus from the relationship where the relationship could be fine and you could still have an independent life outside of that. Not every difference has to be a death sentence to the relationship, but indeed some things are. The things that are really death sentences for the most part, right, should be how you feel in the relationship and how he treats you in the relationship. The things we mention and love you all the time. 
character, kindness, consistency, communication, commitment to character, right? And how you feel in the relationship, right? But the things that, you know, he's a, he's a, not a great dresser. He's a, he's an shorter than I wanted. He doesn't listen to really cool music. He's not as fond of, of camping as I am. These are things that really most of us could work around. It's hard enough to find someone who understands you, listens to you, sees the best in, of you and wants to be with you that I don't want the tyranny of small differences to ultimately affect your relationships unless it has to. So finally, our love you love story for the day. And as I said, there's been a good run in love you. Sunday was the anniversary of my first date with Mark. So we celebrated by going to the coffee shop where we had our first date. We also went out for a nice dinner the evening before to celebrate. We just turned last week from an epic trip to Yellowstone National Park with his family. It's so hard to believe how much my life has changed from a year ago. Certainly when we were having our coaching calls, I never imagined I'd be on a family trip to Yellowstone, a place I'd never been with my boyfriend. Adventures aside, we're very happy, we're very busy. I've been consistently happier in the past year than I can remember, remember having been in a long time. I'm still not sure how you brought me from being forever alone to happily coupled, but I'm so glad you did. Coaching was well worth the investment. All the best, Elizabeth. Elizabeth wrote that testimonial to me one year after we worked together. She is now married. I don't know if she's pregnant yet. She was in her late 30s when we started working together. So I hope if you're listening, Elizabeth, you'll follow up with me and let me know if you started a family or not, but I do know she is married. So if that feels good to you, and it should, if that's what your goal is, my name is Evan Mark Katz. Uh, I thank you for joining me on today's Love You podcast. For more episodes like this on YouTube, click on the subscribe button, ring the bell to get notification when future episodes come out. If you want a man who makes you feel safe, heard, and understood, and who among us does not, uh, go to evanmarkkatz.com forward slash apply. Watch my free video about fixing your broken man picker when you're done. Apply to love you and join other smart women in a coaching community where you're going to finally learn how to choose a good guy who takes care of you and loves you unconditionally. I can't wait to see you there. Thanks.